Hey guys, it is your girl Naj. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, I'm happy to bring you another video. Uh, my little channel is just taking off. It's all a part of my master plan, you know, my little known secret. <laughs> anyway, it is not about the followers on this channel. It's not about anything fancy. Um, it's really just a place to speak about my truth and my journey and if I can help anybody in any way, um, if I can just be a voice of entertainment, of uh, even a devil's advocate, whatever it might be, informative, I just, I gotta put my truth out there and so I'm so happy that you guys are on this journey with me. It's why I called my page, my channel, is The Real Najwa because it's the real me, it really is, and I'm happy that you guys are on this journey with me. I'm, I'm gonna tear up, no, I'm just kidding. So um, today I have taken a couple of notes and I want to talk to you about how I finally watched Bridgerton. Oh my God, um, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. I, I guess I have to first sort of preface this video with letting you know that I am a huge, huge geek for like the Tudor period. That might not mean much to a lot of people because I actually studied art history. And so um, there are these few pieces of these periods of time that I just totally fell in love with when I was younger in school. And um, it just continues to fuel a little obsession with me. That obsession is, um, so I love period pieces that specifically focus on monarchies. And that could be anything. Like, that could be the British monarchy. I've been watching a lot of, like, South Korean shows. So it could be the Korean. Or if any of you guys have seen the show Empress Key, um, if it's, Scottish, if it's African, Egyptian, um, uh, the other one I can think of is Indian. Um, I've watched a few Indian shows related to their monarchies back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. Um, and so I really, really do love shows that center around sort of like court living, the, the living of the, the, the sort of inner workings of courts within, if, if that's what you want to say, within like, you know, um, a monarchy setting. Yeah, that's, I guess that's basically what you would say. My favorite periods with that is Tudor, uh, Elizabethan, and uh, Rococo, if you're gonna go for the French aspect with Marie Antoinette. So, um, one of the biggest ones is the British monarchy because it's just one of the most prevalent, you know, monarchies in the world, you know, so we, we know a lot of history for them and we also um, exert, observe how that history has sort of played out into the way because the, the British monarchy exists today. And so I basically, I'm prefacing all of this to say that um, I didn't just randomly stumble onto Bridgerton. I actually am an old theater geek and an old art history geek. And um, I basically studied a lot of art that has come from different monarchies and, and stuff like that. Specifically the British monarchy. Um, especially with the, but more so for me, with the Tudor and Elizabethan period. I'm not as... Um, how do you want to say I'm not as versed on sort of the Victorian era or what came after Queen Victoria, but it's, it's becoming something that's more and more interesting to me as time goes on. I just, I was really, really drawn to Henry VIII and Elizabeth I because, and, and even Bloody Mary and Mary Queen of Scots, um, because it seemed like they all had like a bit of personality to them. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you want to like, how you want to bring it down, but Queen Victoria, I always, she just looks so somber in every single photo you look at the woman, so. Um, but I'm starting to see influences of her. I don't know. So the, the, the Chronicles of Bridgerton, I don't know 
what time period or I know what time period they're set in but I don't know who the actual king of this period would have been based on or loosely based on if you say because you got a black woman who's the queen uh, her husband is like uh, checked out like seems like he's got dementia or something um, you have Indian and black dukes and aristocrats and stuff. So obviously the show is not completely um, from, a, from a factual standpoint. At the same time, you can definitely see and tell that there are influences from real life, real aristocrats, real kings, real queens, real dukes, real duchesses. Um, real Viscounts that are basically just reflected in this new age modern take on stuff, right? So, um, I, I don't know who the king would have been. Maybe somebody who's British or who's more well versed in their art history. Maybe you guys could comment in the comments below and let me know. Um, I don't know if it would have been King George or... Edward? I, I, I don't know. I'm really not too good with stuff after, like, uh, I would say the 1500s. Because it's just not what I've um, focused on as much in my studies. But it's something that I'm really, really taking an interest in. Um, so, let me just take a look at my little notes here. Because there are, it's so juicy and it's so good. I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk about how the... What I don't even know how to call her the Bridgerton mom the mom who's the head of the Bridgerton the matriarch of the Bridgerton family who's like the, the show starts off with her trying to get all of her little chickadees out and married right um why does she look like Kate Middleton's mom she looks like Kate Middleton's mom she looks like Kate Middleton's mom <laughs> like that has just been sending my brain in a loop for forever and I'm gonna get to why I feel like it's been feeling spending my brain into a loop um, not just a random point but hold on to that the other thing is Seema from Real Housewives of Cheshire another brain loop thing why am I talking about Seema from Real Housewives of Cheshire how is that related to Bridgerton we're gonna get to that um, I also want to talk about a sort of sociological and political aspect of this show it seems like it's trying to touch on some little hot buttons, but not going too far, but at the same time going kind of far. And, you know, I, I really want to touch on that. There seems to be an aspect, we'll say, to this show that seems... I'm like coming up to my chair, so salacious. Um, there seems to be an aspect to this show that seems to be... Um, from what I've read in articles, some articles, I don't know who it was from, so don't ask me, but uh, some British publications basically call it like an escapist type thing. You know, basically like, oh, uh, life was not that good back in the, you know, the late 1800s, early 1800s or whatever. So, you know, let's not, let's not go and pretend that all of this was this awesome, you know, with multiculturalism and Sort of like, you know, the classes thing is still there, but there's people of all different races. There's Indian people, black people, Asian people. So, um, we'll see. <laughs> and uh, I also wanted to talk about sort of the dubious genealogy of countries. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to how that relates to Bridgerton. Um, but yeah, let's talk about this. So, I'm not really going to give a breakdown on this video of the plot of Bridgerton. Um, I can give a little brief synopsis for people who haven't heard of it. So it is a British show and it is um, d diffused on Netflix, you know, so it's a series. Um, and it basically chronicles the life of this family named Bridgerton. And the Bridgertons, um, there's basically a widow, a mom of seven or eight children, something like that. A uh, high middle class, upper middle class, aristocratic woman. She has her, I think, three daughters and f uh, four sons. Or either I have that reversed, maybe. Um, she's got a bunch of sons, a bunch of daughters, half and half. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so it basically chronicles their lives. It go goes right into it of basically how her husband has passed over recently. Her oldest son, um, the Viscount, who's going to be the Viscount Bridgerton, basically is taking over the role of the man of the family and trying to get his sisters married off. It's got a lot of the sort of pride and prejudice, you know, type stuff going on. Um, but like I said, it's not, it's, it's very loosely based off of historical figures, but it seems more like it's got a story that was written, you know, written to give us this modern feel, even though it's from the 18th century. And so, so I doubt that the Bridgertons actually exist, but I think that there's lots of people that were like the Bridgertons. So it's, it's very loosely based on reality. Um, but what catches viewers off, you know, off guard or whatever it is, is that there's, this shows British aristocracy, but there are a lot of multicultural players within the, within the, sh within the show, you know, written within the plot. So the first sort of daughter that the Bridgerton, uh, lady who looks like Kate Middleton's mom, Carol, um, is sort of getting out into the, the season so that she can be seen, so that she can get married, so that she can be courted or whatever. Um, that's sort of who they focus on first is this daughter with the red hair. And um, her brother is sort of the one pushing her out into the world. Now, no, she's Bridgerton. She still has a lot of other daughters, you know, but the first season sort of focuses on this one daughter. And um, the guy who she basically falls for, the guy who falls for her, all of this, you know, honor and going back and forth and duels and all this stuff that happens, he's mixed race. You know, he's like half black, you know. So that right there should already get you off guard. You're like, wait, this is based in the 1800s, but there's a black duke? That doesn't exist. <laughs> so, um... I just have to talk about this. I have to talk about this. I actually think that it is so ironic that this show, I think it came out in 2019, right? So this is like in the middle of Kate, I'm sorry, uh, in the middle of Harry and Meghan's sort of stint as royals in the UK, uh, or as royal couple, rather. Um, so very, very questionable, uh, interesting arrival for this show based on the time that it is. Let's just get into straight into some of the socio-economic, you know, political stuff. So I think it was very, very intentional that this show came around then. I think that Netflix, America, America's relationship with the UK, the UK, the UK, I feel like there's a lot of developments probably underway right now that are sort of preventative, um, that like, I feel like the British press and the monarchy and the, the prime minister, the cabinet of the prime minister, I feel like they're kind of influencing <clears throat> this thing that's happening in the media where people are trying to educate while at the same time uh, what am I trying to say? Trying to educate while at the same time saying, oh, this is what we could be. We, we could have um, a, a very integrated society where everyone gets along. And, you know, of course that's not it. And, and even in Bridgerton, there are slight hints, you know, because I, the way I would think of Bridgerton is, is like it almost exists in its own universe. It's not our universe. It looks like it. It looks like, you know, the, and I know I sound totally crazy right now, but stay with me. It looks like, you know, the monarchies and the, uh, the aristocracy of the 18th century and the United Kingdom. Yes, but I think in a way it can also be interpreted as something that is a conversation starter about this new dynamic that we hold today from being like, a more multicultural integrated uh, society. You know, we have the LGB LGBTQIA movement coming. We have the feminist movement. We have civil rights. We have Black Lives Matter. You know, we have all of these things that are working to make the world more integrated than it was in a time that has passed. 
whether you support any of those causes, whatever, you know, at the end of the day, what you have to recognize is that we live in a changing landscape. We live in a changing world, and I think that this show attempts to address it. Now, of course, one single show can't solve all the world's problems, but I do think it's really interesting what it does try to do, and, and I really, really like it. I really like the show. Um, I think it's ironic that this show came before things absolutely exploded with Harry and Meghan because I feel like the people who really, really need to watch this show and see that just because I come from a middle class background, just because I'm an actress, just because I'm American, doesn't mean that, you know, the monarchy is tainted with my blood, you know, or something like that. It's like, we live in a different world, and I feel like it's ironic that this movie came out a, a bit long ago, not too long ago, but uh, a bit before all of this stuff broke down with Harry and Meghan, because I think that the critics of Harry and Meghan could have something to take from this, you know? It doesn't always have to be about race. I feel like that's what people um, like Piers Morgan, like the Sky News is, um, like the Nana Akua, I, I don't even know if that's how you say her name, um, the Bethany Franklins, all the people speaking out against Harry and Meghan, I feel like these are people who really just don't get it. I feel like they just don't get it. May it whether it be that they just don't have enough people in their lives who are from whatever it is, minority groups or, you know, people who have gone through struggle, like people from a lower class income. But I feel like a lot of people are just not informed you know it's like they're not informed and they're not exercising that empathy muscle you know it's like that empathy muscle just hasn't been worked out um bridgerton looks like kate middleton's mom the mom looks like kate middleton's mom i thought that that was very interesting because not only does her face kind of resemble her her mannerisms you know and the way she is with her daughters i thought that the people who saw this were very, very aware of Carol and Kate Middleton, very aware of basically what Kate Middleton will be stepping into very, very soon before we even know it, and very aware of what a chaste, um, matriarchal, you know, honorable woman looks like, you know, to the British public. And so I definitely think that this, this series pops into areas of I don't know maybe some sort of geopolitical propaganda almost in a way not really propaganda because it's, it's a creative creatively written show and I love it uh, I have to give kudos to the writers but I, I think it makes us ask some questions we'll say that um what questions does it make you ask I, I think um I want to talk a little bit about the fact that you do have all of these people of color in this show. Um, the question of dukes and, and black queens and black aristocracy in, in the UK. It might seem kind of absurd. But um, I feel like me right here. Uh, a black American woman in front of you. Who absolutely knows just because I'm a black American woman. That means that. My, my ancestors were slaves in the United States. And that means that my blood is not, you know, tracing our roots, my family tracing our roots back to Ghana, because that's the only way we know our roots. We like, we aren't like my, my African friends here in France who know where they come from, who know that their family came from Cameroon, came from uh, Ivory Coast, whatever it is. Like, black Americans, most of us don't have that luxury because we were dispersed, you know, from our, our homelands. But knowing just from genealogy and research that my family comes from Ghana, I know that it's not just a uh, Ghanaian in here. There is um, Cherokee Indian or, or Native American. There is Caribbean. There's Caucasian. There's Eastern European. Um, it's like... Our roots are so, so, so mixed up because of the displacement that happened with slavery. And that's just something that, that has to be accepted, I feel like, world worldwide. Of course, we can tick these generalities and boxes when we're going to renew our driver's license or take a standardized test that says, 
I'm black, I'm Asian, I'm white, whatever it is. But of course, unless you have literally only married within your ethnic group, and all your genera generations before you, and your parents, and your grandparents, and your great grandparents, only they only marry people with, that were in that gene pool, like within this race. It is absolutely astronomically like ridiculous to think that um, there weren't black dudes, there weren't black dukes, there weren't uh, black aristocrats, there weren't black war generals in the UK. Those people did exist, and many times. I guarantee you, I, I, I feel like some of them, their gene pools could have been dominant towards the Caucasian or the either European um, or the, um, what is the word that I'm looking for, um, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, you could look in their gene pool and you could see that that was a more dominant gene and they might have just literally passed as white people. Um, and maybe the some people, their genes were more dominant towards Caribbean or black or African, whatever it was. So they might have appeared more black and maybe they had a completely different life from a person who was very, very close to being their sister, their brother, their mom, their cousin, whatever it was. Basically, what I'm saying is Bridgerton is, call it escapist, call it what you want. But we actually can, knowing what we know now that history probably did have people with African ancestry who were dukes, who were aristocrats, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. You get it. Um, and that is why people are similarly still just so butthurt and so angry that the audacity for Harry to even marry a mixed race American actress, you know, like, of course, that, that, that boils some people's blood because, you know... As I said, as someone who lived in London for six months, as someone who does have a little bit of obsession with some uh, British history and things like that and art, I can see why people who call themselves avid monarchists or even people who are just sort of like just fairly monarchist, you know, not, not even extreme, uh, I can see how someone coming in and changing things can be a little bit disconcerting. But I think shows like Bridgerton basically introduce this philosophical discussion that basically says things are not always as they have been. They're not always as they seem. And things can change. Things can morph and evolve. And you have to grow with those changing tides. You cannot just sit somewhere where things are adapting, growing, changing, you know, moving above where your station is. And you just say, no, nope. <laughs> I'm not moving with the change of tides. I'm going to sit here. Like, if we were actually talking biblical level, like literally, if that's what was happening, a storm was coming and tides were changing, flooding, and you just refuse to move, you just sit there, I think we both know what's going to happen. You're not going to survive. So... Um, but I love Bridgerton. I really, really do. Oh, the one thing that I didn't get to talk about, Seema. Yes, Seema from Real Housewives of Cheshire. I actually really, really like Real Housewives of Cheshire. I would say my favorites are, of course, Real Housewives of Orange County. First one, Vicki Golfson. Uh, but then I would go to New York and then Atlanta. But maybe Atlanta and New York sometimes interchange because they're both so good. Um, but I love all of them. Like, I, I love the Real Housewives franchise. Although I don't agree with everything that Bravo does. I'm going to go ahead and put that out there. I do love me some Real Housewives. And Real Housewives of Cheshire is no um, exception. You can definitely see some subtle traces of cultural differences like... The Real Housewives of Cheshire's ITV, you know, the Real Housewives of the other U.S. franchises, their Bravo and whatever. We can get into it, but the, the basically the, the, the foundation of it is basically the same. You know, it's women from different, maybe they're from the same echelon of society, generally, but usually they're so different. You know, they're so different and they're basically thrown together and forced to get along and it's usually not getting along um but when Seema came in I really liked her I really really liked her especially as someone who is a woman 
a woman of a minority, a business owner, you know, I was like, oh, she is doing her thing. The only thing, and it's not as relevant now because Stacy is gone, but I feel like Stacy was a really bad, a, a negative influence on Seema. Even though they were good friends, um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> it's Real Housewives of Cheshire. If you need to look up, look it up. Okay, whatever. Um, but yeah, I feel like when Stacy and Seema t were together, you know, Esther, that phone call, that voicemail, is just proof that they just devolve into... Ugh, something that just happens when women get together even me sometimes like I've been just with certain people sometimes and you just all of a sudden just gossiping and all of it just it just comes out but I, I yeah I, I feel like Seema hanging out with Stacey sort of lowered her because you can tell Seema was raised by a good Indian mama like you can tell and she's even though she is someone who is um, very well spoken, you can tell she's educated, you can tell she's gone to the right schools, she's been connected with the right parts of society. Um, and I, I, I wanted to relate that to Bridgeton because not even on like a racial level or anything, but she reminds me so much of the character um, who, who butts heads with the Viscount, the, the future Viscount Bridgeton. Um, the older sister. I'm sorry I'm slipping on her name. But that just demeanor of like, I know I'm a bad bitch. <laughs> and I don't need you to tell me. Like, I feel like there's more women of color in the, in the UK who are like that. That the UK probably does not put forth as much as they would love to. But they definitely exist. So, Especially with the UK's relationship with India, you know, all the way through, like past the, the transatlantic slave trade, but into the Industrial Revolution, we know that minorities have built some of the biggest empires. And that not only have they built the empires on a labor, a lower working class type level, they have graduated to the higher echelons of society. Um, all types of people. People with... Uh, European, Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian blood, people with Indian blood, people with African blood, people with Caribbean blood, um, people with Arabic blood. It like literally it happens and uh, I think it's time for society to accept that. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. I loved Bridgerton. Thank you so much. Make sure to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. <laughs>